Hi, this is Abdul Bharti and we are here at Open Source Summit in San Diego and today we have our old friend Jono Bacon. Uh, <laughs> Good to see you. You do so many things that I don't actually want to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> your name is, Why don't we just cut it off right now? <laughs> yeah, your name is synonymous with the open source community and you know, right. uh, you, you help companies uh, with their open source strategies and a lot of things. To, so let's start with what are you doing these days? So. Pretty much, pretty much that. Like one of the things I've been really excited about is, you know, I started consulting about three years ago, and what excited me about that was, I'd spent my whole my, my career um, basically working completely in open source and working for a couple of companies, like we all do, and I realized, you know, I, I just I don't have enough experience. Like I feel like I've got a reasonable sense of how things are going. Um, I think we'd had some good success in some of the projects that I worked on, but it's a big world out there. You know, and communities are, there's so much um, kind of domain experience that's wrapped in that. It's like this big umbrella of how do, you, how do you define your audiences? How do you reach out to them? How do you bring them on? How do you get them started easily? How do you incentivize them? How do you measure the work? And how do you do social media and content? All these different pieces. And I just came to this realization, there's just so much more I can learn. And the only way to do that is to get your feet wet and to get in there and work with a whole bunch of different companies. So that's what I've been doing. I spent the last, the first couple of years of that really just focused on learning how to do that. I'd never consulted before. Well, I consulted on the side a little bit. Um, but that was, you know, understanding the relationship you have with a client. And as a consultant, you you have influence, but you've got no power. So like, how do you build an agenda around around what they want and then how do you get that through and that in itself has been an interesting exploration of human dynamics so and then the last year i've just been working on this new book people powered and that's consumed a reasonable chunk of time we'll talk about your book uh, but before that i want to because you have been part of the community for very long yep you know, early katie days or whatever yeah, it is 20 years now 20 i years. can't believe i'm getting old we're both getting old, man. Right. Your hair is still black and brown or whatever color it is. It's man. mostly. Yeah. You've got the salt and pepper thing going on. Which right, I like. right. And I was surprised because Dirk has beard, Greg has beard, I have beard, so I said, Linus going to get beard too? So yeah, you know. I don't, I don't know if he'd see I've never, beard. I have never seen him with beard. He says he works it from home, he's in the bathroom. When do you get, you always, you know, polish your face. <laughs> I've never thought of it as polishing your I've, face. I've, 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 I've seen almost everybody with some kind of stubble of beard, but never Linus. Right. You just keep that kernel always, you know, sharp I and discovered, clean. like, when I, sh I shaved this off once, mm -hmm. my head mm -hmm. is a perfect ball. This right. is an optical illusion, people, that makes my head look normal. So. And that has kind of become your brand identity also, right? <laughs> right. Sideburns and the goatee. Right. Uh, so, uh, you have been kind of, you know, you've seen the evolution of open source mm. work from the early days, from your M. Stallman days to today's world. So, can you talk about the evolution of open source over this yep. year and the community with it? I think it's really interesting. Like, when I, when I got involved in 1998, um, my brother introduced me to, to Linux. I'd never heard of it before. And I was just getting started with the internet. And back then, of course, you know, the internet was relatively nascent. Like it wasn't, I think it was a little different in the US, but in the UK, you had to pay to get on the internet. Like you had to pay 10 pence a minute. And like it, was, it wasn't like unmetered um, access in the US. So people were, in England were on the internet for relatively short periods of time, but the concept of it was fascinating. Like you always want the thing you can't really have. And um, I read about, about all these people all over the world working together on this on this software platform. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. And um, I think we've spent the last 20 years just figuring out how that works. You know, in the early stages, it was, of course, you formed together into little projects. But there wasn't, like today, you've got GitHub, where you put code or GitLab. You've got standard tools that we tend to use. Back then, it was just you kind of figured it out. And, you know, you'd, you'd either host your code yourself, or you'd host it on a, something like Track, or, you know, you'd set up a mailing list. And there was some fundamental pieces that started forming back then, but people were just basically having a go. And I think it turned into a bit of a Lord of the Flies environment because frankly, the projects that succeeded had good developers who wrote good code and people who had a sense of how you could get people to work together. Because it was, I think we fell into a mistake in the open source community where, particularly in the early 2000s, where we thought that setting up communities was somewhat intuitive because we'd already seen a lot, a lot of open source projects at that time. And I think as we started growing and more and more companies were coming in in like the early 2000s, like when IBM put like a whole bunch, a bunch of money into, into Linux, for example, I think we were under the impression as a, as a broader community that, okay, we've got all these new people coming in who don't come from open source. This stuff is fairly intuitive. You just join a mailing list, you get started, you fix a bug. And I think a lot of people were realizing this isn't intuitive at all. This is actually really weird for the rest of the planet to understand. 
And now I think we've gotten to a point where we've really started breaking down all of these fundamental pieces of how open source works, like the software development lifecycle. Now we have a diagram that explains how software is built. And it's taken years to develop that diagram. Um, and just tons of trial and error. But that to me is the beautiful thing about open source is that, is that you know, I learn every day new stories from different projects and what they've done and how they've tried different things and how events run. And this kind of corpus of information is really starting to form. And, um, and of course, you know, we've gone through eras, like there was the, the early era of, uh, of you know, people obviously wanting to build like client-based software, like desktops, right? And then we tried the commercialization of desktops and that worked to a degree, like was, we were doing that at Ubuntu and it didn't work to a degree. We've been through devices like the netbooks and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's been, I think it's been interesting watching it. Yeah, I remember the the Unity net notebook that uh, Canonical came out with, and I had a Dell Mini, and you right. know, you know, that interface worked very well there because there was not much you know real estate on the screen. So yeah, th those were like really fun days, you know. But yeah. one thing that I have, I mean, not I have. Everybody knows that in early days, uh, open source contribution would be in that you are working in your free time, you know, at night after your work day. But now, uh, even the Linux Foundation's uh, uh, the reports come out, you know, that eighty to ninety percent, you know, developers are paid. Yeah. So that has so commercialization of open source, not commercialization, yeah. but you know how it's. The product versus project. Yeah. So that has also kind of changed the whole economics. Yeah, hugely. And, and the, the, the way community works. So can you talk about that? What you've yeah. seen there? Yeah, I think it's changed a lot. I mean, we've been through so many business models. You know, uh, I was talking to someone about this last week. That you know, if you think about all the business models we've explored, there's been you know dual licensing. There's been open core today. There's people selling services. There's people selling merchandise, um, box sets. Uh, of all these various bits of software over the years. And I think that one of the, the tricky things here has been, okay, there's kind of two challenges here. One, how do you make money in a predictable way? And then the second thing is, how do you balance that relationship between your employees and your community members? And the model, a model that is seemingly falling out is a fairly popular model here today, for example, is open core, right? So you have an open source piece of core piece of software in a project. And then you'll have some additional services and uh, proprietary products usually on top of that. That usually covers things that you'd want to do if you integrate that into a business. And that's a, a, logical, a logical model. And it's worked well. It's worked well for people like HashiCorp and Mattermost and MySQL and places like that. The tricky thing is the, with both of those challenges between how your employees work and how your business model works, there's that connective tissue between the open source project and your commercial project product and that connective tissue and how those how those are glued together that's where the rubber hits the road if you don't get that right you're going to have a disaster on your hands and a lot of that in my mind is com is communication for example so for example what if someone builds a feature for your open source project that replicates a feature in your commercial product how are you going to handle that the worst possible situation is that like swap null builds the feature that you submit it as a pull request and then we reject it because of some unwritten rule that you can't build things that are in the commercial product. So how do we prevent that? And we prevent that through good communication, good relationships between the employees and the, and the, and the community members. So there's, I think there's been all of those little nuances that we've had to figure out. And the other challenge here that I think we learned in, in open source is that in a company, you always have more information than your community members. So like when I was at Canonical, for example, I had a sense of, first of all, who was working in the company. I knew, my, I used to work for Mark Shuttleworth. So I knew his perspectives, I knew his philosophy. I also knew our customers. I knew the culture of the company. And we as human beings, when we don't have information, we often just fabricate it in our brains. We just kind of jump to conclusions and assumptions. So I think a lot of this has been figuring out what are those dynamics and how do we crisp them up and understand it. And that's really hard work. And it's hard work because it requires an enormous amount of nuance in open source. You need to understand open source very deeply to know what are the questions we should be answering and then have solutions for those. And I think we've really, a lot of that's been figured out over the years. We're not there 100% yet. Like open core is still very much in development. I think it's the early stages of it. But like dual licensing didn't work out mm -hmm. as much because there wasn't a much of a, as much of a return. You know, oh, I pay to use exactly the same thing, but I can license it. That's not gratifying enough as a business model, but mm -hmm. open core can be. So. so, but don't you see that open source kind of compromised the actual values of open source? 
It's a good question, uh, and you know, my friends in the free software world would say that that um, no, even not the free software world, for just purely open source world, like let's say Kubernetes, you know, right. or any other code. If it's been open core, then you won't be able to build things on top of that. You know, the, the whole reason open source, is, like Linux, is not open core. No, you know, Kubernetes, well, I, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, right. none of that is open core. So I think, and I think you can build on top of it, so long as we're clear on it. Like my philosophy with everything in life, and not just open source, is it's all about setting expectations, right? Like you and I are doing this right now, and when we talked about this yesterday, we set expectations around what we want to do when we talk to each other. And I think it's the same thing with the project. Like I think if you basically say, for example, okay, we've got this open source project, and there's this big commercial stakeholder behind it, and the expectations is this: like our community can contribute and participate and play a role, and you're you're an equal in in what we're doing. Then you'll have a very, very healthy open source project where people can do mean, meaningful work and build on top of it. If the, if that open source project is presented as open, but really is just a bait and switch to get you to use your commercial, you won't succeed. Mm -hmm. And True. you know people see through that pretty easily. Yeah. So I think that's the thing. I think I think you can do open core and have that level of flexibility because in many cases the priorities of the community and the company are very different. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Mattermost, who I think are doing a great job, they're an alternative to Slack. Their open source project is very healthy. They've got a great, they used to be a client of mine. They've got a great relationship with their community. And their commercial product primarily focuses on integrating Mattermost into a business. But if you're, you know, watching TFIR and you're, you're a fan of Mattermost and you're setting up your little community and you want to add a feature because it's missing something, you probably don't care as much about integrating it into a business. So therefore, you can add that feature and it might get into Mattermost and that you feel part of a, a really fulfilling project. So it's that detail that I still don't think we've codified that yet. You know, we, we understand a lot about open source, but that connection point between those two pieces, we really haven't, we haven't got any, we haven't got a diagram for it yet. Right. <laughs> like the software development life cycle. Perfect. So how much of this is covered in your upcoming book? Or what is the book all about? So the book is called People Powered. Um, it's going to be published by HarperCollins Leadership. It comes out in November. And I wrote this because um, uh, a lot of the companies who I work with, just when they, when they reach out to me, they either have a sense of community. They've seen communities in action. They've seen Kubernetes, or they've seen Star Citizen, or they've seen Salesforce, whatever it might be. And they, they think, OK, I'd like to do that around what I'm doing. Um, but they typically have no idea about how they go about that, how they hire the right people, how do they bake that into their existing culture in, in their company. And the book basically focuses on that. Like I wrote The Art of Community, <coughs> you know, 10 years ago. And that's a very, um, it's a very pragmatic um, guide for an open source community manager, right? So if you're building an open source community, it's very practical in that way. But what it doesn't do is it kind of gets very, very technical very, very quickly. Uh, so I think for a lot of people who just want to kind of zoom out a little bit and say, OK, what is the bigger picture of this work? What is the value of open source? Uh, sorry, the value of communities? How do I go about building a strategy? How do I get people in my company to participate in that? And then how do I integrate it? How do I hire the right people? Who do they report to? What are the maturity models for being successful? That's the goal of people power. So it's a little bit more high level. Um, but I think it will appeal to a slightly broader audience than the art community because I think the art community was very much a, an open source, uh, very open source centric book. So I think if someone's watching this, for example, and they're thinking, okay, I'm interested in communities, I'd like to explore this, I'd like to learn more about it, you can think of People Powered as presenting kind of the recipe for how to do it. And then, you know, the specifics of how you get into executing that recipe are very unique to your individual community. Like if you're building an open source community, you know, obviously you're going to be doing focusing on engineering. If you're going to be building a community wrapped around, um, let's say, a public service or a local meetup, then you'll take a slightly different approach. So People Power provides like the the blueprint around how to do that. Awesome. Well, before we wrap this up, uh, this is one question I want to ask. I always wanted to ask you, though I do know a bit about that. But when you're not helping companies build community, what do you do in your free time? I know you'll talk about music and stuff like that. <laughs> so I'm really into I'm really into music. Um, been playing music since I was 16 and um, I have a little, little studio at home that I write music in and I, um, I've been wanting to get back into a band when my son was born 
I wrapped up my band because we were playing, you know, we were rehearsing three days a week and playing at weekends. So, uh, yeah, I just love playing music and I love gin as well. I collect gin. So I have a little gin map because uh, my goal this year was to try gin from every country in the world. Mm -hmm. So I put a little map on my website where I'm tracking all of these different gins. And it's great because people like will call me and they'll say, hey, I went to Australia. I got a bottle of gin for you. So, so does that mean you're almost always drunk? No, no, I have a bit of gin. <laughs> no, gin is not something you want to drink too much of. It's not good. So, yeah, okay. I like the taste of it. Yeah, I have seen some of your pictures on Facebook where, you know, you're, 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 you're uh, playing guitar when your kids are taking a bath and shower. So, so <laughs> do they get sick and tired? Daddy, just go away and let us <laughs> peacefully. I think sometimes, yeah. I mean, my, the thing I'm really proud about with, with our son is this is the nurture versus the nature. Mm -hmm. it's, like his favorite band is ACDC. Oh, then, that, that's what going to be my question. What yeah. kind of band they listen oh, to? He this? loves ACDC. He loves Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. He's six and a half. Yeah, when I make tea in the morning, you know, say, I play Iron Maiden or Metallica. You know, my wife right. would like, can you play something nice like Beethoven? I said, no, I want energy in the morning. I know. You know? Yeah, this is I'm my coffee. Going. This is my coffee. And some people don't understand, like Rammstein, you know, or something like that. When I play that, I just get all the energy that I need. Yeah, it's I. I, I music is is awesome. It's, mm. it's it's the unifying language of the world, right? Right. It's, uh, you know, and I, look, I'm happy for him to do whatever he wants to do. But you should talk. Yeah. Music. You should talk to Jim Jim Lin from the next foundation. That all, for all the next, uh, at, at least for the next open source summit, they should have a live band with you there. <laughs> You know, Angela and I, who runs the events at the LF, we've talked about this because when we used to do the Ubuntu Developer Summit, mm -hmm. you probably remember this. Like, yeah. We used to have a live band on a Friday night and it was a ton of fun because attendees would play. Like, it was a really good time. Um, Sousa, Sousa Company, they have the, all their engineers are, you know. Yeah. So they play their band. Yeah. And it's all, for all the, and Nils Brockman, who used to be CEO, he was also a very good drummer. Oh, so cool. every time I interview, I said, when I'm going to see your debut. But, you know, he stepped down. So I was yeah. like, okay, next year, are we going to see it? He said, we'll see. And he said, no, the drummer is the engine of the band. Oh, yeah. You know, and I, I'm good at, at running a company, but running a band, I may not be that <laughs> yeah, good at. It, yeah, exactly. So, it's, so much, it's such a great bonding experience it is, when it people is. get together. And the energy that you feel, oh, yeah. it's amazing. And it's great because when you do it in a setting like that mm -hmm. and people feel they can just get up and have a go. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we, we'd do it at, at our Ubuntu Developer Summit and we'd have someone play. We had, we had like, like egg shakers and someone playing the you know, maracas and... So you didn't necessarily have to be able to play an instrument. Right. You just got to get up and have fun Whatever, and have yeah. a go. And mm -hmm. the, yeah, the relationship, the bonding between everyone was... was but great. you need to have beer also, to be honest. You know That's what? If you're going to have a load of people who've never played together, it's probably not going to sound very good. So <laughs> if you have a few beers beforehand... No, for everybody. It, it lessens, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For everybody, it lessens the blow. Yes. <laughs> okay, Juno, thank you for talking to me thank today. You. And uh, good luck with your book. Yeah. And of course, when the book is out, I would love to review a copy of it. I will and send you a copy. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you so much, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, sir.